Hi everyone, um, my name is James. I'm a transport planner at Arup and also a, the vice chair of the Yorkshire um, Young Planners Steering Committee. Um, welcome today. Um, we are running a Ask the Experts series of presentations, um, which provides opportunities for young planners to learn and engage with different topics and themes relevant to planning. Um, I'd like to thank Will Steele, the chair of the Yorkshire Young Planners Steering Committee, for organising this session which is the first of the um, Yorkshire Young Planners uh, kind of digital events. Um, today, the session is on transport planning, um, which were brief instructions to the profession and also a focus on COVID-19. Um, the pandemic has obviously had an unprecedented impact on how the number of trips um, people make and how they've made them. Um, we've seen dramatic drops in how many trips we've been making during the height of lockdown followed by an upsurge in the amount of cycling trips as people shun public transport. Um, the 9 to 5 commute, uh, commute into town and city centres, um, a common phenomenon uh, across the country has largely evaporated. Um, however, as lockdown measures loosen and the government encourages the population back to their workplaces, we've seen travel, uh, traffic levels steadily increase again and cycling trips level off. So what are the long-term impacts of transport on transport planning and have we missed that opportunity to revolutionize how we travel in this next country? Um, next slide, please. And if we just um, do a bit of housekeeping. Um, so we've got the session boxed in for an hour. We have approximately half an hour for the presentation followed by another half an hour for the Q&A. Um, please submit your questions into the control panel at any point throughout the presentation and then we'll run through them at the end. Um, your mics will be muted throughout and please keep these muted. Um, the session will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. Um, so don't worry if you do miss anything because there'll be an opportunity to go back again and look at it again. And finally, a survey will be presented at the end of the session. Please do complete this and it gives the RCPI valuable insight into what works well for these kind of digital events and also what can be improved. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our expert, Matt. Um, so Matt Rudman is, I'd like to first of all just say thank you Matt for taking your time out of your schedule to speak to us all today. And Matt is the is a regional director based in Leeds, um, who leads the Vectos team in Yorkshire and North East. And he has over 20 years of professional experience in UK, in UK transport planning and engineering field. So I think he's well qualified to be speaking today, so thank you Matt. Um, First of all, before Matt uh, delivers his presentation, I'd just like to introduce the Young Planners Network to people. So the network is open to all professional planners in the first 10 years of post-qualification experience. Uh, I've included a web link uh, into the presentation to the RTPA website, which provides some more information on the network and how you can join. Um, there are several groups across the, across the country um, covering all the regions, so I'd encourage you to go on the website and seek out your local group. Um, there are several benefits to engaging with the network. Um, as part of the as part of the your, uh, Yorkshire Young Planners Student Group, we are keen to deliver a wide range of events um, from CBD networking and social events. And these will provide you with the opportunity to develop your network, uh, meet new friends early in your career, and develop your CBD. Um, the RCPI is currently running a comprehensive cadre of events throughout the rest of the year, so please do look on the website to see what else um, may be coming up, which is of interest. Um, so over to you, Matt, to complete your, to um, do your presentation. So I'll turn my camera off and mute myself uh, while you're presenting. Thank you, James. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present to you all today. I'm really uh, privileged and uh, pleased to be doing it. And um, good afternoon to you all. Um, pleased to be talking about transport planning. Um, movement and travel, I think, are key to all our lives. On average, people in the UK spend just over an hour every day travelling. And this includes, on average, 35 minutes by car and 11 minutes walking. It's about the same time as we actually spend eating. So, thinking about travel and movement, Moving in time and space connects us to various different elements of our lives. Moving connects us to different places where different activities take place. For example, work, leisure, shopping, education, and healthcare. 
So it's fundamental to the way we live our lives. The presentation today should hopefully take about 25 minutes. It's split into six main sections, as you can see on screen, with James chairing the discussion afterwards. If you pop your questions in the chat box, we'll deal with them at the end. And my aim for today's presentation is to highlight how transport planners, and transport planning, and town planning are key to solving so many of the pressing challenges we face from climate change to public health. Throughout this presentation, I'm going to refer to transport planning and transport planners as a loose descriptor of the groups of professionals, individuals, politicians, community groups, charities, campaigners, and councils who are involved in the planning facilitation and provision and improvement of transport infrastructure. Essentially, transport planning is people planning and demonstrably improving access to services, improving quality of life and improving well-being. Transport planning done well enthuses communities, individuals and works at a human level. Academically and literally, the role description is above. An art and a science, drawing people from all walks of lives and all walks of life and backgrounds. Transport planning has traditionally been linked quite closely to civil engineering, but I'd like to explore the link to the town planning profession today and other development professionals in this presentation. And in case you're wondering. Uh, the photo is from the Vectos study day last year in Rome. Um, it was traffic clogged, I note, but also really beautiful. So quite an interesting clash. So just a bit about what a transport planner does and what is required. It's a mixture of technical and people skills like most jobs these days. Um, I think transport planners work best with, uh, within a data rich environment. Collecting information about transport, analysing it, drawing conclusions, making decisions and communicating these to others. These are all the skills that the transport planner needs. A little bit about Vectos, the company that I work for, what I do. Well, we're a small independent transport planning consultancy. In the north, there's around about 30 of us, transport planners and engineers. We're engaged in consultancy for about 100 clients, and we span the public and private sector. You'll see from the screen that we've got niche skills in certain areas. I've got colleagues, for example, who are expert in infrastructure design and also international research, which I'll be touching on quite a bit in my presentation. And the international research really leads me quite neatly onto my next slide. And I'm sort of moving into the um, first main technical part of the presentation, which is global trends and the global environment in which transport planning sits. And I think we need to think about some of these topics on the screen and how they're impacting how we travel around at the moment. So, for example, the internet's having a massive, massive impact on the UK, particularly, and particularly thinking in terms of retail. I've got a little statistic here that um, online sales now account for 30% of all UK sales. This is up from 20% last year, so a 10% increase in one year. Um, and it was about 8% a decade ago. So spending patterns are changing and associated with that is how we, the removing the internet, essentially removing our need to travel, but in adding uh, delivery journeys and things like that. So it's changing the way we travel. Another sort of interesting point that I thought I would mention is how vehicles are powered. 
we're used to the internal combustion engine powering most of the vehicles that we see around about us, but that's changing. And now we're getting electronic uh, electric vehicles. Um, we currently um, account for about 3% of the UK fleet, but I mean, this will uh, increase quite a lot because um, the internal combustion engine will be banned in the UK by the year 2032. So in 12 years time, we won't be having um, petrol or diesel engine vehicles in this country. The impact that has is reduced pollution in terms of emissions and hopefully noise as well, but also it does require the power powering these vehicles. I certainly know that um, in places, many, many cities across the UK, they're grappling with changing policy to enable electric vehicle parking to be accommodated within um, developments. The third uh, bullet point covering vehicle technology and autonomous vehicles, and basically there's a rise of um, artificial intelligence being installed in vehicles around us um, with the uh, eventual aim, I think, of trying to uh, remove the need for a human driver. Um, they're not fully there yet with the autonomous vehicles, but um, many cars do have a lot of technology built into them. Um, and one area I thought was quite interesting is the um, is autonomous buses, which potentially reduce the cost of operating public transport massively if we can actually get to that point. There are further mobile technology um, is another disruptor and has really disrupted the taxi and private hire market now with Uber. All you need to do is press on a button and you can hail a ride. And that has been absolutely massive in terms of um, disrupting that sector of the market. And we may see um, more of that and we may see more uses for mobile technology changing how we travel around. And finally, I wanted to touch on demographic and society, changes in society. Um, as a society in the UK and Europe, uh, we are owning uh, fewer cars and younger people are tending to, um, attending to own fewer cars. So, we're like we're moving from a quite a car dependent generation that's possibly my generation and the one before it and we're moving to a society that values electronic connection virtual connection a bit more than physical connection achieved through travel so these are the global trends that are changing the context and environment in which we travel around and if we move down from global to national trends. I thought I'd just pick up on a few issues that are relevant and have been sort of driving transport in this country, the UK, over the last year or so. Most of you probably know that the UK government declared a climate emergency in 2019, as did the Scottish and Welsh um, governments. And when it was declared, the Green Party leader instantly made a comment about the government saying, on one hand, uh, they announce a climate um, emergency, and then on the other hand, they support airport expansion, which might undermine this. But the climate change bill was passed, but it didn't actually have any binding elements to it, and there were no actions associated with it. So perhaps be regarded as uh, empty rhetoric in some regards, but I feel like, um, and I think it's fair to say that um, a lot of this um, climate change and call for action has been picked up at city and authority level. Again, I think most of you will be aware that city and local councils have also declared climate emergencies and are actually developing policy and plans to achieve outcomes such as net zero emissions. Uh, apologies for um, the, uh, everyone based uh, down south or in other parts of the country. A lot of my examples in this presentation are sort of Yorkshire centric. 
So one of the examples I've got is Leeds. And for example, they are having a climate conversation, uh, which is an attempt to involve the community from the bottom up. And that's picked up on strong links between the environment and climate change and transport, particularly with regards to waste management and resilience and planning. So these things, these issues, are talked about nationally and dealt with locally. And if we do drop down to regional and local issues, again, um, perhaps with a slightly northwards bias, um, the new UK, the UK government, when it was elected, was elected on a strong mandate to level up the north. HS2 and NPR were the sort of flagship transformational schemes that were mentioned particularly before the election. And I know that since uh, since then, they have sort of confirmed that they're still committed to these. And we've seen regional devolution in the North. And I think that's the key to improving transport in some of the larger urban areas. We've seen that the control over the budget saves bidding time and allows more accountable decision making effectively allows areas to prioritise um, transport investment in the way that they want. And I think going back to the previous slide, we're seeing that cities and authorities are tending to lead on environmentally, better, environmentally beneficial schemes, urban transit, reopened railway lines, district heating, etc. etc. So that's the national and the regional context. But we had a massive, massive shock to the transport system. It's the whole country with the coronavirus outbreak. The picture I'm showing is the M62 between Leeds and Manchester um, at a time when the, the motorway was fully open, but zero traffic. Motor traffic, as you can see in the graph on the, on the right hand side of the screen, dropped massively virtually overnight uh, from to about a quarter to a third of what it was before and since then we've seen a gradual rebound i think when we were in the trough there were lots and lots of noticeable impacts of this um, sudden loss of traffic vehicle traffic lots of people noticed the reduced noise and reduced pollution that were apparent and obviously without cars it created space to do lots of other things particularly walking and during the height of the lockdown um, it, it, walking was allowed and permitted um, there were initial restrictions on how many people could go out walking, but these were gradually eased to allow more, uh, more activities to take place. And I think this combined really well, like I say, with the absence of motor vehicle traffic. Similarly, cycling absolutely rocketed upwards um, during lockdown. Cycle shops were allowed to remain open at all times. And I think cycling was viewed as being quite a robust, dependable way of moving around, particularly if you're a key worker or whatever. Um, we notice now that the cycling use is beginning to drop back a bit, but there are certainly several initiatives, and lots of things that are being done to try and encourage uh, cyclists to remain and to continue and lots of investments that are being made to encourage that. Public transport was massively impacted um, during the coronavirus outbreak and in, during the lockdown period essentially the government message was that public transport should be avoided unless you had a valid reason or you were key worker and the journey was absolutely necessary and essential. Um, 
So this resulted in lots and lots and lots of empty trains and buses traveling around. And now we're bouncing back and moving out of lockdown. This is causing quite a big problem in terms of the government's message has changed. Um, now use public transport with a mask and socially distant, but use has dropped off in so many areas and it's across the modes that it's going to be quite difficult uh, to convince people to come back and use public transport. So that's one of the issues I think that we've got to deal with as we emerge from coronavirus. Um, the response around the world has been quite similar, really. Um, initially, we saw, in response to the drop off in motor traffic, tactical urbanism to the fore. We saw quite a lot of pop up cycle lanes being rolled out across the UK and across Europe. And we saw um, footways and footpaths being widened in. Uh, albeit with temporary pop-up cones and things like that to enable people to walk safely and uh, socially distanced. So active travel tended, active travel, cycling, walking tended to be at the, full, the forefront of the initial response. And eventually the government caught up and the UK government central government decided to announce uh, a two billion pound green restart to local transport. Critics said this was mainly previously announced funding, but the government has enacted changes to legislation to enable pop-up cycle lanes and widening of footways. Uh, an e-scooter trial is going on in Milton Keynes at the moment and a couple of other cities, I think. Um, and this is really a good, a nice use of modern technology in an active travel mode. Um, and I think will be really popular with um, younger people and potentially we'll see quite a lot of e-scooters knocking about our towns and cities, I think, in the next few years. You can see from the slide that there were several news items about the impact that um, the coronavirus had. And uh, were, are we or were we actually moving away from a slightly dated way of thinking? I've called this the old normal. And I think coronavirus has enabled us to take stock of how we planned transport, how we planned towns and cities and other places. I think it's true to say that car-led policies over decades previously, based on the predict and provide model of assessing demand and then trying to build infrastructure for it, has led us to where we are at the moment with a lot of cities and towns that have problems with congestion, traffic, pollution, and things like that for public realm. And I think this old model is certainly being questioned at the moment. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that um, it's unsustainable with regards to building a way out of congestion. And I also think it's unsustainable with some of the government's environmental aims and objectives, but what, what is replacing it? And again, um, the new normal is, is what I'm trying to, how I'm trying to sort of express what's happening at the moment in terms of people working from home, the use of technology to carry out meetings, presentations, etc. It's interesting to sort of, I've got some statistics that 35% um, of the UK society um, were working from home exclusively during coronavirus. Um, now this has dropped to around about 20% of the workforce. 
and around 35% of the workforce were traveling in during coronavirus, presumably key workers, etc. But now people traveling to work counts for about 55% of all the workforce. And the new normal for public transport is obviously hugely restricted due to social distancing still. And I think that's going to cause some problems in the short term until an effective vaccine can be introduced. This has got a knock-on impact of public funding. A lot of the larger authorities like London, Manchester, uh, are, are in some way reliant on ticket revenue from public transport, certainly for funding other forms of transport. And now that revenue has been taken away. And essentially every public transport operator in the UK is currently supported by the UK government. And that's not sustainable, it's costing the country too much. Um, we, we need an effective public transport system and we need to work out a way how we can get back to that. Um, I haven't really touched upon international travel and flying. More disruption was uh, caused about two weeks ago when all of a sudden the government announced a lot of uh, transport, international transport restrictions due to outbreaks in or outbreaks and rising rates of infection in other parts of the world. So for example, people in Spain and France had to quarantine on return for two weeks. So this is more disruption to the uh, transport system. A lot of people cancelled holidays, a lot of people had to readjust their plans. That had knock-on impacts. Um, we noticed that the uh, roads in the UK became uh, a bit more congested, particularly in coastal areas, and people tending to do things like go on day trips. And as we look forward to perhaps are they going to get any more? Uh, local lockdowns, um, international travel restrictions. Um, we also factor in getting back to school this week and next week and see what impact that might have on travel patterns. Um, I thought it was quite interesting to look at travel patterns during the day. Most of you would be familiar with traveling to and from work, quite congested travel period across all the different modes, busy trains, busy roads, busy buses, but not at the moment and certainly not during coronavirus where we've seen that um, basically the peak hours have been flattened. They no longer exist in the same way and we see a sort of general build up of traffic and travel across cities throughout the day. And I've been trying to work out why that is. Um, and one of the, the, the reasons I thought was perhaps it's a slightly more relaxed attitude to office hours and office attendance where flexible working patterns have been allowed or encouraged by employers. I think there's an element of uh, fear about crowded situations on public transport. Um, yeah. And basically, that seems to be making flattening out the peak, the traditional peak hours that we associate um, with our life. Um, I hasten to add the graph is just uh, was from last week, so it doesn't include school transport. So as I head towards the end of my presentation, I, I'm thinking about the future and how we emerge from post-COVID times and what is the problem with transport and what, what are the issues that we're dealing with? And I think one of the things I did want to briefly talk about was the, um, the part that transport plays in carbon emissions and climate change. And certainly I just wanted to highlight the fact that I don't think we'll get to net zero which I know is a key objective for most places, without significant changes to how we move around. It, I think it's accepted that motor vehicle traffic damages the environment in many ways, damages our communities and our health. Um, and also, I think 
it needs to be set against the, the general desire for economic growth that's needed to come out of the coronavirus recession, but also generally that we want safe and healthy growth, and ideally growth that's not environmentally damaging. The graph I've shown shows you a percent of total person trips per year, and it's I think it's quite interesting. Um, people in England, on average, travelled 6,500 miles last year, and they made 957 trips on average. I think traditionally we've always focused on the trips to and from work, which is the top bar the commuting for business. But we can actually see that that doesn't make up that greater percentage of total travel. And you can see it is absolutely dwarfed by uh, the leisure travel, which accounts for about 50% of all travel, and sh uh, trips associated with shopping, which account for about 20%. So there you've got 70% of all trip patterns associated with non-work trips that are very, very car dependent. So I've set out a vision for the future and how can we change and what can we change? What can we do? And what are the levers and solutions that we can pull on and implement to get us to where we need to be? As I mentioned in the last slide, I think there's been too much of a focus on transport to work and from work. This only represents a relatively small proportion of the overall travelling public. And only probably uh, really for a certain portion of the working week. It doesn't cater for all the travel needs of various communities. And I think it's been diverting resources away from um, healthier modes, active travel modes. I think it's fair to say, just to back this up, that uh, I'm going to use some travel statistics that most journeys in the UK, the vast majority, 68% are less than five miles, so potentially cyclable, and a whopping 43% of all our journeys in the UK are less than two miles, so potentially walkable. So, these are the modes we really need to be uh, focusing on, and certainly walking has got great potential uh, to increase and take uh, a much greater proportion of how we move around. They're, they are classically underinvested modes, um, and you know perhaps perhaps we need to discuss how we spend our transport investment. So that is a transport, those are transport planning solutions. But also I think it's important to think about the places that we're traveling around in and the places impacting the need for transport. Uh, this is where good town planning comes in. And I wanted to touch on place-based solutions and the impact that they might have on changing how we go about moving and changing the places that we live in and work. Effectively, we can reduce the need to travel at source. We can just remove journeys, which obviously is of benefit if things are located close to each other. If we cluster certain types of development around public transport nodes, where you can get good public transport and have good active travel infrastructure. Again, I think we're building in a healthy approach to transport. One other thing I did wonder about, which is perhaps the most up-to-date point, is whether the changes in the government's land use classes and the change in moving between land use classes without planning permission, whether that would enable conversion of under allocated retail office units, perhaps for residential, and whether that would actually be a sustainable solution to some of the transport issues we've got. Anyway, perhaps one to discuss. And how does this play out, this move away from the old normal to the new normal? 
and trying to achieve better uh, growth and a more environmentally friendly way of moving around. And, I've, and how does this impact what we do on our day-to-day -day basis? And I've, I've called this moving to a vision and validate methodology. So instead of thinking predict and provide in terms of how am I going to facilitate cars driving around? How am I going to count the number of cars in a steady state environment? We move to a place-led approach where we link to town planning. We have a more qualitative assessment of space where road space follows function and we, humans, communities, people, decide how we want spaces and areas to behave and what purpose they need to have. And the uh, traffic modelling and think transport modelling is subservient to that. So that's a quick look at how that might work in reality for us at the sharp end. I wanted to just pop up a little photo and for my thoughts on the future. And I think we'd all like to move to a place where we have more physical mobility, less vehicle dominance. We can be better connected at a human level and have a better technical connection as well. We can be better connected to each other virtually, so reducing the need to travel. So those are my thoughts and a quick whiz through some of the transport planning issues that I thought were relevant to today's presentation. I hope the presentation has enabled you to have a little, a few thoughts, um, how things are changing and what can be done really through the joined up actions of transport planners and town planners. I hope that it stimulates some discussion. So I'll hand back over to James now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, I'd just like to quickly just talk about the role of um, planners um, in transport planning. Um, just in terms of um, my um, own experience, so I complete a town planning degree at Newcastle University and I'm a chartered town planner myself. Um, I was actually looking after to take a year out placement at Transport for London, which um, really developed my interest um, in transport planning and development management. And after my placement, I returned back to TfL to work there for approximately four years, and then moved um, up to Leeds and Arup in Leeds, um, where I initially worked as a town planner for a couple of years before transitioning into the transport planning team, where I'm currently based. Um, and I've, what I found is that my town planning degree and my town planning experience has actually been really beneficial to developing my contribution to the profession. Um, it's given me exposure to the influence that politics can have to the development and management process. Um, I hate my skills in critically analysing the planning policy and strategies and understanding the various mechanisms of the development and management process. Um, now obviously there's several skills that you may not necessarily be able to develop through town planning. Um, however, there are potential employers out there that may be willing to support um, yourself through a postgraduate qualification, such as a transport planning masters, which may develop those more technical skills, which are more specific to um, the transport planning. So what I just wanted to do was just highlight that if you are currently undertaking your studies or are curious, curious about a career in transport planning and have a town planning qualification or experience, then it's certainly a valid career path um, and your skills can make a viable contribution. And Matt, I understand that you yourself work, you work closely with a colleague in Leeds um, who has a playing background. So I'm just quite keen to understand um, just a little bit of input from yourself, just kind of how you felt that kind of contribution to, to your practice. Yeah, I think it's it's been really, it's really helpful to have that link between um, planning and transport planning and we value the input that our colleagues make in terms of bringing a slightly fresh way of looking at things and perhaps a more sort of wider understanding of the issues. Well, I think a lot of transport planners get really excited about um, the nitty-gritty. I think it's, it's really nice to have, have a fresh view and I certainly would encourage 
anyone who's thinking about it to have a good look at it. You know, um, a couple of my colleagues, you know, became chartered town planners, but even um, through the ITPI, but even while still working in transport planning. So um, it can be done, and I think it's a, a good journey for quite a, quite a few people. Yeah, thank you. Um, if we move on to then the Q&A, um, so if you just jump on to the next slide, please, Matt. Um, and I'll just, so I've got a couple coming through. Um, if we um, just kick off then. So Olivia um, has asked, what advice would you give to a graduate um, about to begin their career in transport planning? Um, I'd like to encourage um, anyone who is thinking about it to have a good, good look into the profession. Um, there is lots of there are lots of resources out there on the Transport Planning Society website, on the Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation. Have got some really good things on skills and career paths. I think it's I've had certainly had a really rewarding career. I mean, it's had its ups and downs, like you know most people's careers will have. But I found it to be you know I do actually get a lot of satisfaction from it, and I sort of. You know, I do enjoy my job quite a lot, so um, I enjoy coming to work. So I think if, if you are, if you have got the enthusiasm, I'd urge you to try and to, to, to go for it and look into it, and um, you know, maybe even try and get work experience or something like that to start off with. Like you said, James, that was how you got in, and I think if, yeah. once you've sort of got the bug, um, transport can be quite a rewarding, you know, an interesting career to go into. But then again, I would say that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and just follow on from that. Um, by my earlier slides about plugging your networks, because um, obviously, a really good opportunity to kind of um, chat to people. So, obviously, the IDPI network is open to students and it gives you an opportunity to obviously rub shoulders with professionals who may be employed. And you, know, you can speak to them about opportunities through that. And they may, you know, they may be potential kind of summer placements, industrial placements. That may be available that you may not be aware of. Um, so I would, yeah, I would encourage you to really engage with people through those kind of networks. Um, I guess actually this is probably quite a similar question. Um, so Jamie is asked, so I'm on an integrated master's course by the M plan at Lee's Beckett University. Um, how would I go about getting into transport planning? Um, so yeah, I think there's probably quite a similar answer here. It's just kind of it's building up your network, looking at getting those um, those placements as well. Um, I mean, in terms of, I guess, what kind of qualifications are you looking for, Matt, in terms of if you were kind of having some CVs in front of you? I mean, a transport master's isn't necessarily a necessity, is it, if you're coming through at maybe more junior level? No, it's not. Um, we cert Like I say, we certainly would look at um, people who, who didn't have them. Uh, but I think we, we look for... Um, Speaking from Vectos's point of view, for good people who are passionate. So if you're interested in transport and you've got that passion, then that goes a long way to ensuring that you'll be successful in the workplace. And, and another thing I, I sort of tried to convey earlier was that it's not just about dry transport planning drawings on a page. It's uh, about communicating with people and having people skills, uh, being able to talk to other people about transport and sort of trying to um, you know, do, do all those sorts of things are sort of um, useful and helpful attributes to have. So I think I, I would certainly sort of say that those things are just as important as the knowing a lot about transport. Yeah, I mean, just to follow on from that as well. So I, I don't necessarily have, necessarily have a, um, a transport planning master's myself, um, but obviously I'm kind of um, quite far from that within my profession as a transport planner. So I wouldn't necessarily consider that those technical qualifications are a barrier to entry to the to the um, to the career. Um, if we just look at the next question, um, so Patrick has asked, um, so what do you think will be the biggest impacts of the planning white paper? on transport planning 
Um, and then just for obviously a bit of context is that this was obviously a uh, consultation that's gone up by the government on some pretty substantial planning reforms. And the RTPI actually recently um, undertook a kind of round table discussion. And I believe that's recorded and it's likely on YouTube as well. So please, if you are interested on that, um, check that out. That was actually a really interesting debate. Um, so yeah, I'm um, just quite keen to some them. Matt, kind of what do you think the impact of those uh, changes in the white paper will have on, on transport? I can only really speak um, authoritatively on my sort of day-to-day -day job, which is um, quite private sector orientated and generally to do with new development occurring. So we, we sort of think about how government legislation and white papers might influence what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think um, the changes that I mentioned in the sort of user class, use class um, designations and the ability to move uh, between different uses in a building was potentially quite interesting for us. We were sort of wondering whether that would cause there to be more development or less development or you know uh, less work for transport consultants big questions like that uh, and I think wider questions about you know uh, almost like a zoning approach to development uh, was certainly quite interesting and uh, you know perhaps conferring greater powers on people to get stuff done um, was interesting but then sort of worrying about you know um the plans and infrastructure that are needed to support the development and whether that would still be able to be done at the same time because otherwise you're just going to build build stuff without the necessary infrastructure so we were sort of chucking these ideas around i don't think we came to a particular conclusion um but it's something that we'll be keeping an eye on and um yeah and hopefully it'll be a beneficial change and you know, we'll see it working out well for the next few months. But, you know, I don't know what you think, James. Yeah, I mean, I'm quite keen to understand the implications of the Section 106 and the SIL. Um, I think there's an acknowledgement within the white paper that they are too complex a mechanism. Um, but obviously, you know, transport mitigation that is one of the key, key kind of mechanisms as to how they're secured and they're actually delivered. Um, and it's also, you know, you would go back to that traditional kind of, these, you know, there's only one cake and it's about how you split it up between the different requirements between the schools and health and transport um, and community facilities. And I would be quite intrigued to kind of see how, how would that, be split up using these new tools that they're looking at going forwards and we you know what will take precedence because there's only there's only a finite amount of resources and money that can be invested in these section 106 kind of contributions and mitigation um so yeah i'll kind of just see what will take a fall back you know what will come to the forefront um you know will transport remain kind of a significant take on this mitigation um i think that's yeah one of the key things i'm kind of looking out for um then another one here so um early in the year the the uk government committed to a 27 billion pound program of road building, building over the next five years and you did touch upon this briefly in your presentation um but, and they're also consulting on the transport decarbonization plan uh, which considers the contribution transport can make to achieving net zero greenhouse gases uh contributions green greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2050. Um, cars and HGVs make up the largest contribution to these emissions um, and therefore to what extent do you consider the road building program is compatible with those aims of reducing gas emissions and also following off on that as a transport planner who may potentially be working on schemes such as road building and airport expansion what advice do you have for those who are feel perhaps conflicted that they may be contributing to schemes which may have a negative impact on their environment? Yes, good one. Um, yeah, good question. And I can see there's tension in the question really between uh, a very large um, figure, a very large amount of funding for road buildings, 
I think, sort of strategic road building we were talking about, and the tension between that and the government's environmental objectives. And you know, um, we, we do, we are in the UK trying to juggle between um, economic growth and you know enabling people to move into new areas and to develop in certain areas mm -hmm. and also to hopefully reduce some of the congestion and other damaging issues we've got at the moment and perhaps some of that is resolved through road building and i think as well we're trying to build roads responsibly and do it with an eye on the environment and i think being a transport planner you often have to weigh up um different things you know in appraisal in in your career uh, and you have to consider different um, you know different objectives and i think we're certainly moving towards a place where we may have road investment and it may be substantial but also be building quite a lot of facilities for uh, safer more active travel modes that are perhaps less polluting and i think that's probably where if you're feeling conflicted i think knowing that those elements have been included is certainly um, helpful yeah i mean also i guess also it's an opportunity for you to kind of influence the design and form you know of the road in your profession so i think it's also quite exciting opportunities if you are finding yourself working on these kind of road schemes airport schemes where at face value you may feel they are going to have that nice contribution you know just have a think about how how we can influence the design um and the form of these schemes to really make actually make a positive contribution um so i think that's actually quite you know it's a couple of exciting opportunities as well um we've got another question here from kenneth um so given that town planners at development consultancies local authorities will only go through traffic impact assessment reports briefly in daily working how can public private town planners smoothly transform their role for their work to become transport planners um i think i'll just like make a big contribution to to this and just say that the the role of a transport planner isn't necessarily just focus on those tra traffic impact assessment reports or transport statements or transport assessments there's actually a broad range of stuff that transport planners actually get involved in and i think i picked up it on my slides and also matt just kind of listing out where those kind of contributions are so you you are kind of thinking about those master planning um also um kind of business case work as well you're, you're kind of developing the um the positives and negatives of certain options you're appraising them against um against policy um and how they can contribute towards the environment so i, I wouldn't say that but i mean some people it may be a large part of their day-to-day -day job um but if you work in a consultancy where there is that variety to work on different breadth of projects um i wouldn't worry too much about maybe not having that experience working on traffic import in the you know, traffic assessments or statements because there is opportunities to work on a wide breadth of work um you know which draws upon kind of lots of different skills um so matt did you want to have a, add anything to that just to say uh, about a career path there is a career path uh, with transport planning if you want it through to like chartered status um, so and I think if you're invested in that and the company or the organization uh, which you work for is invested in that and wants that to happen then that will almost inevitably lead you to questions like you've just asked and uh, basically uh, reflect on your own experience and perhaps make sure that you are a rounded transport planner and that you do have experience in these other areas because that will help you make better decisions and work better so i think as you progress through your transport planning career and if that's on a chartership career path then uh, you will naturally hopefully get those different types of experience like you said james cool thank you um so we've got two more questions uh, to look at so we've got alistair who was asked um keen to understand that the speaker's views on the initiatives that have been seen in city centres whereby space is being temporarily made available 
to allow for social distance travel, which was resulting in a number of streets becoming more cycle pedestrian dominated rather than vehicle dominated. Um, so do you think that these initiatives uh, are here to stay? And also, I guess that kind of just are important on how well you, we feel they've worked. Um, so Matt, you obviously work in the city centre. Um, I've got a confession, I've not necessarily been into a city centre for like the last six months because I live out in suburbia. Um, so I've not necessarily had kind of a direct um, view of how well they've been working. Um, so Matt, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on this. Yeah, um, I'm a cyclist, so I cycle into work most days in Leeds. Um, and there's some pop-up cycle lanes in Leeds. And they've worked pretty well in terms of uh, they are trying to um, formalize uh, existing painted on cycle lanes and to make them into a bit more physically segregated with uh, pop up what's called wand orcas, um, which are like the little traffic cones that pop up and down if they get hit by cars. And that sort of little cheap infrastructure. Uh, that can be installed quite quickly has actually, I think, improved things, made people feel a bit safer. Um, and I think they've worked pretty well. And, and I mentioned in my presentation, cars are on coming back now. So I guess there's a sort of a balance to that of, well, there's a bit more, there's a few more cars knocking around now. So uh, people are potentially a bit more nervous and anxious about that and the safety um, concerns associated. But I think they've been good, and you know, I would I would always welcome investment into things like that. And I particularly think about you know young people who are perhaps less confident, who perhaps need and really value the physical separation that these things are looking to achieve. Hopefully, then they can be converted when funds allow to more permanent. Uh, so I think I think they do work well. Yeah, and what I'm quite keen to understand as well is that I think mean, you've picked up on it in our RTPI piece uh, of research is just the role of the city centres um, as we see a transition perhaps to more activity within those towns, villages and suburbs as people spend more time locally, they shop locally. Um, we know we're potentially going to see a reduction in the importance of those kind of corridors into the city centres from the suburbia. Um, I'm quite keen to understand to what extent moving forward with that investment in those um, in those schemes move towards maybe the the towns and villages rather than focusing on those city centres. Um, you know, as the role potentially of city centre changes and evolves into maybe more of a place where people live um, rather than actually kind of having that nine to five commute. Um, so yeah, I'm quite keen to understand kind of how that changes going forward. Um, so we've got one more question here from Jamie. Um, given the necessity for more local connectivity and sustainability, do you think a new light rail system, as well as new rail lines reopening in Leeds and West Yorkshire, should start as soon as possible? Do you want me to answer that one? Yeah, go on. <laughs> as quickly as I can, so I appreciate we're running out of time. Um, yes, I do. I think they're I think they're great ideas, and um, I always try and welcome. Like I say, I always try and welcome transport investment, and I think uh, certainly light rail is much needed in in, in 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 West Yorkshire to connect some of these places that really we need a viable alternative to the car, and you know perhaps linking um, Leeds and Bradford with a light rail system would be a really good idea. Um, you know, perhaps going out to places that don't have very good connections and trying to connect some communities where there is no, there is very uh, a, tr a tricky alternative. And I think similarly, opening railway lines. You know, we've seen in coronavirus just how important moving freight around is, and things like that, and having a sort of robust transport system is part of that. So I, I would welcome both those things, and I would support them pretty much wholeheartedly. Yeah, and obviously Leeds has quite an interesting history with light rail. We'll see the next generation transport scheme um, being scrapped. Um, so it will be interesting to see if you know if there is momentum for a scheme going forward. To what extent do we not make the same mistakes again? And can we actually get something something built, which would be which would be fantastic. Um, 
so we have actually come to the end of our time. Um, and what I would just like to, to do, um, I think there's one more slide, Matt, which is just wrapping up, um, which is to um, say, obviously, look at the RTPI website, uh, where there's actually quite a um, packed schedule of future events, um, which I hope of interest to, to people. Um, a survey will be issued to people who registered on the soft, on this um, seminar software. Um, so please do input into that because it gives us actually really useful feedback on how the event, how well the event works, and will help improve uh, future events as well. And the presentation, the video, and the copy of the answer to questions will be emailed to attendees next week. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Matt for your time, taking your time out of your day to present to us today, and obviously everyone attending as well. And thank you for your questions at the end. Um, they were really, really, uh, really interesting. So yeah, thank you everyone, and thank you, Matt. Thank you.